You got it. Oh, here we yeah. go. Cut me out of the recording. <laughs> That's probably for the best. <laughs> <laughs> and next, Dr. Algas, could would you like to go? Hello, I'm Dr. Algas. Um, I am an assistant professor of emergency medicine at UC Irvine. I'm also the wilderness medicine fellowship uh, program director. Um, my uh, fellowship is not as uh, old, <laughs> it's pretty young. Uh, we have this, uh, our third fellow this year. Um, we're trying to build something that is as uh, good as like the, the, the fellowships that have been there before us. I did two years at uh, uh, Harvard's MGH program. That's where I graduated from. Um, and then came here to start the, the fellowship. As you can see, we're in sunny California. I'm gonna go paddle boarding in just a bit. You can actually uh, be in the mountains in six hours and then come down and have a surf. Um, we also are very unique in that we have our own uh, island. We, we cover Catalina Island and they, there you are the only sole provider uh, for the freestanding uh, critical access ED, um, which um, we, uh, UC Irvine uh, runs and you are required to go and work there. Um, what else? Yeah, we'll go into in the details later on. Excellent, thank you. And Dr. Della Justina. Hey everyone, I'm Dave Della Justina. I'm the I'm at Yale. I'm the uh, residency program director and also the Wilderness Medicine Fellowship director. I uh, we started the fellowship in I think it was 2016, and uh, we do various things with our fellowship in terms of um, get a diploma in mountain medicine uh, and. Uh, some other some other courses and lots of teaching with uh, wilderness medicine education AWLS and, and other courses and uh, as you probably would understand in Connecticut we're not spending a lot of time at altitude but we do go elsewhere for it but we do spend a lot of time learning and and educating others and writing about things like tick-borne disease and and all the really cool things that ticks can give you which are not so cool so uh, and happy to answer any other questions as we go on Thank you so much. I'm happy that we have programs from across the country joining us today. So we get a wide spectrum of individuals. Um, Dr. Gardner and Dr. Gaynor, would you mind going next? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Jesse Gaynor. Um, I'm the Assistant Fellowship Director at Virginia Tech Carilion. I was the first fellow at this program, so I've helped develop a lot of the curriculum and so forth. And um, kind of one thing about our fellowship, we're really focused on education. So if you're um, hoping to be an educator, that's that's kind of at the heart of our fellowship. Um, we help with the WMS elective a great deal, teach AWLS, we teach the med students, PA students, um, we teach our local EMS um, entities some wilderness medicine because we live right by the Appalachian Trail, so they're going up there on the trail and getting folks from time to time. Um, and then we do some community education as well um, for lay people that like to get out and recreate. Um, we're in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's really pretty. Like I said, the AT is right next to us and lots of good mountain biking and rock climbing and so forth. Um, we have a really high retention rate. Like a lot of our fellows have stuck around, including Justin, because um, we, we have a lot of fun. We're kind of like a family. Um, the other sort of big thing about our program is, you know, I think, and we're going to talk about this a lot, but a big part of a wilderness medicine fellowship is networking and getting in touch with folks that are practicing wilderness medicine. And we're really lucky to have um, some great contacts in Nepal and Peru and some ongoing programs there. And so um, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk much more in detail. I'll let Justin say a few words too. Hi, I'm the most recent graduated fellow. I uh, finished in June, now part of the fac uh, fellowship faculty, now full-time ER doc here at uh, Carillion in Roanoke. Um, so I did my fellowship during the multiple surges of COVID and navigated the wonderful COVID restrictions of travel between hospital systems and fellowship and WMS rules and all that. So kind of the cool thing that our fellowship did and um, specifically like how malleable a fellowship can be with the right people involved is we did a lot more local stuff. So a lot of swift water rescue, a lot of uh, whitewater on the new river, 
a lot of local travel because you can't go internationally. But I, at the same time, also managed to finish three fourths of my DIM and did a whole bunch of other uh, training uh, opportunities and kind of moved up within the education of like wilderness medicine and the WMS in general. Now I'm chair of the education committee for the WMS and really involved like nationally and locally with wilderness medicine education. So if you have the right mindset, you can really take it far during COVID. And when you have, know the right people with the right crew, you can really get a lot of stuff done. Thank you. It's a very unique perspective. As a COVID medical, starting medical school at COVID, it's very valuable to hear that um, perspective. And lastly, but not least, Gabby, would you mind introducing yourself? I'm Gabby Glass. I'm the Director of Conferences and Education at the Wilderness Medical Society. Um, uh, so I am the staff liaison for both uh, the FOM program as well as the GME Fellowship uh, section of WMS. All right, awesome. So thank you guys to our speakers for introducing yourselves. Um, and, and like Ashina said at the beginning, uh, we want to make this kind of interactive since there's kind of the perfect size crowd for that. Um, so if you want to ask, if you want us to ask a question for you, you can just DM it to me, Shilpi or Katrina. Uh, but if you want to ask and kind of get FaceTime, uh, you're welcome to just put it in the chat and we'll uh, call on you maybe at like the 40 or 45 minute mark um, for you to ask your questions uh, yourself. So um, first, just want to kind of draw the distinction between what the FOM is and what DIM is versus all these other what I think of as like brick and mortar fellowships. Um, so Gabby, could you just talk to us about what the FOM is or what DIM is, um, how to do that, uh, what kind of people do that, uh, what the timeline is, things like that. Uh, I think that'd be really helpful just to, to just get started. So uh, I'm gonna say that uh, FOM is not a GME fellowship or, or not recognized uh, the same way. It is a fellowship that was established um, by the Wilderness Medical Society in 2005 and starting in 2007. Um, currently, there are about 1,300 um, candidates and about 1,100 graduates, fellows. Um, it is a pretty extensive um, program when it comes to knowledge and um, how to obtain it. And, um, there are credits, uh, you have to earn credits in three different categories. Core and elective come from attending events and experience credit come from your professional experience. Um, as far as DIM, um, that is Diploma in Mountain Medicine and Terry Howell is uh, the staff liaison. So she is the best person um, to give you details on, on DIM. Awesome, thanks for that. So yeah, just check out the WMS website if you're interested in doing that. Uh, my understanding is you can just start that in medical school, right? You don't need to be in residence, you need to get going on your farm. You can start as a medical student. However, I would recommend not starting if you're a year one or year two student, uh, because you only have a, a five years to complete your fellowship. And uh, one of the requirements is a one year of professional practice, which uh, is your, your residency year one is considered your one-year professional practice. Perfect. Yeah, that, that helps clarify uh, for me because that's something I kind of am thinking about doing in my third and fourth years. So thank you for that. Um, okay, we're going to shift over to the brick and mortar fellowships and just kind of talk um, about what is, you know, one of the unique opportunities your fellowship offers, uh, something special that your fellows do. Obviously during COVID, that's a little crazy, um, but love to just hear from, from our, our speakers of, of what is kind of unique about your fellowship or what, what the day in the life looks like for a fellow. I can call on first, Dr. El Ghazi is first on my screen. So if you wanna go, that'd, that'd be great. <laughs> nice. Um, so what is unique about my fellowship? I think that, uh, Number one would be the the Catalina Island, uh, covering Catalina Island, where you can see all sorts of wilderness uh, uh, injuries firsthand. Like we have like buffalo mauling. <laughs> we have people who fall into like cactus and you have to take cactus spines off. Uh, we um, we have uh, had to give um, uh, envenomation uh, uh, from um, 
oh my god why why am i I'm forgetting words right now i'm sorry english is my second language um from snakes snake is a nation um they also do um a lot of diving there we see a lot of diving injuries we also have a diving chamber there um so it's very unique that you are in a place where you are going to practice and you are going to see wilderness things right there in the daily uh basis most of the time in other programs you have to travel and go away uh, to get to uh, see them. We also do um, uh, offer you to travel and do whatever project you wanna do. Uh, we give you, all, uh, our fellows, a lot of uh, uh, time and liberty to do what they want. We can even open up all the way up to three months for you to go wherever you wanna go in the case that you wanna go to, the, uh, to Nepal, to the, to the Himalayan Rescue Association or do any of the other trainings. Um, so it's pretty open right now. Uh, I think the other one of our strengths is that we have a really robust uh, team of people who work with uh, uh, education and ultrasound. Our ultrasound uh, our, the chief of the emergency department is one of the gurus of ultrasound. He wrote all the books. And uh, each one of our uh, medical school graduates actually has a butterfly. So everybody knows how to use an ultrasound and uh, it, doing any sort of project with ultrasound is really easy because mostly we everybody has them and we don't have to incur on that cost. Um, we have access to the UCLA's altitude uh, Barcroft station uh, where we've done uh, projects before. Uh, we do... Uh, um, a yearly national conference in Namas uh, where we go and we ski every year. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a good place given the, the location. Um, and my team of people, it's not just me. I have uh, Dr. Katzer who is EMS trained. He is also part of, the, um, of uh, our adjunct faculty. He works for the search and rescue helicopter for San Bernardino. So we have our fellows go and train with them too. So they have also uh, direct access to SARS training. Um, we have Sangita who is uh, trained in dive medicine. She helps us with that. We have a toxicologist. We have an ID specialist. Um, so I think we're pretty well set up for that. I can keep talking, but I want to give you more time too. <laughs> no, that's that's awesome. That's really cool. Thanks for highlighting all of those. You know, from snakes to altitude to dive, um, being on the coast, definitely California, definitely gives a lot of uh, a lot of cool different environments to, to get exposed. Um, I'll go to Dr. Della uh, Justina. Could you talk about at Yale? Yeah, sure. So I, I kind of gave told you a little bit about what it was when we started. So I the Primary part of our fellowship is getting the diploma in mountain medicine, and we go through the military for that. So that consists of the military mountain medicine course in Jericho, Vermont, uh, level one avalanche course, and uh, a glaciated alpine ascent, which we use uh, Mount Baker for that. It includes a glacier course and, and tra traversing or going across the glaciers uh, and crevasse rescue. And then uh, we have CME for two additional courses or educational things that people want to kind of specialize more in. We also go to the WMS winter meeting as part of it. And then we do a lot of focus on similar to Virginia Tech, a lot of focus on education. We're educating locally as well as nationally in, in uh, Zion National Park and, and Moab. And then internationally, there's usually uh, one or two courses that are potentially able to go to. COVID's kind of caused a little bit of problems with it, but uh, we went to Iceland in September, and we should be going back to Iceland in, in I think, and near the end of August this uh, in 2022, as long as uh, COVID lets us travel. And then maybe, depending on COVID, maybe going to uh, Italy uh, in September of this next year for opportunities to travel and see things. So, um, and then we're we're involved. Like I said, we have a lot of infectious disease things that go on here in Connecticut, and so we focus a little bit more on that and, and tick identification and all the different things that can happen with the ticks and the mosquitoes and, uh, and then some publications. So, um, you know, writing, whether it's in our AWLS book or some of the other books that we're writing or review articles and, and uh, chapters. 
no, it's hard to, you know, in a one-year fellowship, it's really hard to do specific research. That's not a primary focus of our fellowship. I think the only one that pro probably has that focus of a fellowship is the, uh, the one that um, Isabel did in the in uh, Mass General Harvard program, but the rest I can say probably not as big, maybe the Utah one in terms of research, but we don't, research is not a primary focus for us. Education and writing, something scholarly, yes, but um, primary research, too hard to do in one year. Very cool. I hope you get the uh, COVID restrictions lifted so you can get that international travel going again. Um, all right, can we hear from Karelian, Dr. Gardner and Gaynor? Sure. Um, so yeah, just kind of to echo what, what Dave's saying, you know, the past couple of years have been unusual. Um, we have some really great international opportunities that we participated in for the years prior and hoping by 2023, those will be back up and running. Um, one is we have a Nepali exchange program where we, um, we kind of our end of it is Nepali docs that have finished medical school um, come and shadow at our level one trauma center and in kind of while they're studying for their step exams and trying to get a US residency. And we've actually graduated the first two Nepali docs to ever graduate in emergency medicine here. Um, and so that's an ongoing project we have. And then kind of on the flip side of that, we go to Tribuvan University in Kathmandu and we do a wilderness medicine day and ultrasound day and um, that's kind of the first part of the trip. Then we teach um, climbing guides, sort of an abbreviated wilderness first aid, um, just so they know some tick, you know, some techniques to use when they're in the backcountry. And then the end of the trip is we trek to Everest Base Camp and we visit all the clinics on the way up. Um, so it's really been a bummer that that's been put on hold for the past couple of years, but hoping to get that going again. Uh, another thing that we do is we have folks down in the Peruvian Andes. Um, uh, it's called Sacred Valley Health. And what we do is we educate Quechua women in wilderness first aid. And it's been a really neat sustainable program because it, it started out us educating the Quechua women. Now, some of the, um, some of the folks down there are so well versed in wilderness first aid that they're actually now teaching on their own. Um, so we go down once a year, kind of do a refresher, kind of teach some of the new folks that are hoping to become teachers. Um, so it's a really neat program. And of course we visit Machu Picchu while we're there and all the touristy stuff too. Um, so hoping to get our international stuff back up and running. But in the meantime, We've got lots of fun stuff in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Like I said, the, the AT is really close there. And we um, run the AT CME trip for the WMS, which also was put on hold due to COVID, but 2023 years ago, um, where we take a, a bunch of folks that sign up for that adventure CME um, for four days on the AT and do some scenarios and stuff like that. Um, other than that, we, you know, a lot of the kind of standard certifications, DIM, if that's something a fellow wants to pursue, um, we do swift water rescue, AWLS, all those sorts of things. So um, any, anything to add, Justin? Yeah, I, I guess we also do the, uh, the WMS uh, Virginia elective in February each year. It was canceled last year, but it's running now a um, couple months. So it's a month long for students, two weeks long for residents, and that two weeks overlaps with a month long resident uh, student portion. Um, looking forward to being part of the Adventure CME here. I haven't had a chance to do that yet. Um, so I haven't experienced the pre-COVID international travel, but during my year, we did uh, scuba diving down in Florida Keys because you couldn't really go to the Caribbean like we usually do, but we had a great time. We toured the Everglades and learned about like the austere medicine they practice down there. Um, and we traveled to AT. We've done that multiple times, gone on a bunch of multi-day trips on the New River and swift water rescue training. We've taught swift water rescue training. Um, like I said, I, I was able to do the rock portion of the DIM, which is essentially booked up for a little while now. And I'm on the list for the Alpine session. So it's like you do what you can with what you get with um, the restrictions, but hopefully that lacks um, that wanes soon. Uh, like our current fellows have all gotten up to the adventure, uh, advanced level diving, even though we're kind of landlocked. Um, I got rescue certified last year. I'm hopeful to get master by within the next year, but I got some specialties to do. So you can, you can do a lot in our area, but we also have the connections that you need to do the stuff that nobody has all in one area. Um, our current fellow is both a ski patroller and a scuba rescue uh, PA. 
it's kind of hard to do that in most places. So it's pretty cool that you can do that. Um, and I had been an advanced rescue uh, scuba diver for quite a while, but two fellows last year went from no diving experience to rescue diver in four days. So you can you, we're really kind of malleable at getting that stuff done. I know I say that a lot, but um, you kind of have to be if uh, during this uh, cool specialty we're all part of wilderness medicine, you have to be adaptable and um, kind of cool to what you can see. Um, I don't know if it's the right time, but I know somebody had mentioned about FOM. Um, everybody who does a fellowship that's brick and mortar gets FOM. So if you're looking to do more than that, it would be brick and mortar fellowship. Like you can do a FOM just by doing a fellowship. You'll just happen to get it. But I would strongly recommend the quote brick and mortar to go much more in detail and depth than you can ever get with just a FOM. Awesome. That's, that's a nice clarification. And again, it sounds like you guys have some super cool opportunities. I'm from Virginia. So awesome to hear you guys are doing all that awesome stuff uh, close to home for me. Dr. Young, do you want to round us out for this question? Sure. <clears throat> um, I think you guys are all kind of learned that there's a ton of different opportunities across a number of different fellowships. And it's, um, it's just great to hear. I think the field of wilderness medicine has come such a long way uh, to hear all these amazing opportunities from all these programs. Um, you know, the University of Colorado program is similar, I think, to all the others. And the fact that there's um, really just a ton of opportunity out there. Um, and, uh, and really, obviously, what you come as a fellow like what your interests are um is is paramount i think in all, pretty much all these programs you really kind of make your fellowship what you want it to be that said there are special little things to each uh fellowship and here at the university of colorado i think um kind of one thing that sets up sets us a little bit apart is just the number of people who practice wilderness medicine here um being in colorado obviously there's a lot of people who are interested in the wild um or practicing austere medicine um at the university hospital where I work, there's eight of us that are faculty members in the in um, the section of wilderness medicine. <clears throat> and then beyond that, our community has about 50 people who are um, part, um, are kind of uh, honorary faculty members um, who, are, who are basically part of our section of wilderness medicine that don't actually work at the university hospital. Um, the fellowship itself has a leadership team of four people. So there's a, a fellowship director and associate fellowship director, which is me. Um, we have a, a field skills advisor, um, which is Allison Sheets who runs uh, Rocky Mountain Rescue. And then Linda Keyes is our research advisor who um, is kind of a veteran researcher um, uh, in the wilderness medicine community. And so the four of us really lead the, um, the, fellow, the fellow and the fellowship. Um, and I think that's, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities that happen at University of Colorado, but I think what sets us apart is, is just the breadth of different people you're, you you would potentially interact with um, as part of a, as part of the fellowship. That's all I got. <laughs> unless you want me to say, unless you have anybody has any questions. No, no, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, that, that's that's really cool. Uh, yeah, having having all those faculty is is definitely a definitely a boon for for fellowship. I'll pass it off to Katrina to ask our next question. All right. So our next question is: What do you look for in wilderness medicine fellows who are applying to, or potential wilderness medicine fellows who are applying to your program? And we're we doing the same. I'm going first. Again. Yeah, we can do the same. <laughs> right. Whatever works. I, I don't get the advantage of listening to everyone else. Um, <laughs> um, actually, COVID has changed everything. I think that uh, when we started out, there was a lot of interest um, uh, of like the the people who were interviewing of like going out and doing things internationally. Now that we have COVID and the restrictions come and go and everything changes in the blink of an eye. Um, I think I'm looking for people who want to do things more uh, regional at this time. I think there's a lot of things that we need to establish. Um, yeah, last year, um, my fellow, the way that she spent it with the whole COVID is that we have um, research faculty for anything media related. So we did a bunch of uh, wilderness related 
uh, research with um, media uh, databases. Like we we uh, compared tweets <laughs> with like the National Parks and the Search and Rescue. Um, we did other projects with uh, cameras, putting it in national parks and uh, using a special algorithm that tells you how well distance with people. So uh, you can definitely make this whatever you want it to be. Uh, I'm looking for somebody, at least for my program, it's important to be uh, self, uh, like I want somebody that's a starter and a finisher. Um, somebody that is uh, willing to put in the work to establish the other uh, things that I, I think that we need here. We already have a conference that we do over the weekend. We have a camp in San Bernardino Mountains and we uh, teach wilderness medicine for a whole weekend. We have another uh, wilderness race. Uh, and then we wanna expand that to uh, Trans Catalina Trail. We wanna do uh, Disaster Day. We wanna do a, a bunch of other things that uh, hopefully when the next fellow comes, we're gonna have at least four or five different things that are gonna be, happen every year and gonna be established. I, I mean, I, I don't look for somebody who already has wilderness medical experience, although that's, that's good, but I, I feel that that's what I'm gonna teach you. I do wanna see your passion for it um, and to have some sort of uh, good insight into wilderness medicine. Great. That's me. Thank you. Um, just one more follow-up question. Is there a specific specialty you look for that people have pursued prior? And do you accept um, like PAs or NPs? I saw that pop up in the chat as well. Yeah, so so the, the brick and mortar ones, uh, I think most, most of them are based on uh, emergency medicine. There are a couple that uh, admit family medicine. Uh, the way that this is supported, basically you do shift in the emergency department. That's basically how you pay your fellowship and your ability to come in and out <laughs> with only doing eight shifts a month. Um, for uh, PAs and for nursing and other types of healthcare workers, then the farm is, a, is an opportunity for them. Um, but at least UC Irvine, we only do emergency medicine trained doctors because uh, part of your fellowship, you have to work in the emergency department. So you have to give 72 hours, which is the equivalent of eight shifts per month that you can stack however you want and you can do more if you want, but that's what we expect of you. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. And next, Dr. Della Justina. Uh, yeah, would you so, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I got the question. So for us, uh, we only take emergency medicine uh, physicians and, um, and, and then our, our expectation is just someone who has an interest in emergency medicine, non-emergency medicine and now wilderness medicine and uh, whether or not you've done a lot doesn't really matter. It's more your interest in what you wanna kind of do with it and what you wanna get out of our specific um, fellowship. Cause like, as you've heard a little bit, each fellowship's a little bit different. So um, I wanna make sure that if you're gonna to come to my fellowship that we're doing the things that you wanna do as opposed to um, you know, one of the other fellowships. So not, not much other than other than that. And so one of the other questions that comes up is we're a four-year uh, emergency medicine program. And yes, we still take people who have done a three-year residency into our four-year, in, into our fellowship. Thank you. I appreciate the insight. And Dr. Gardner and Dr. Gaynor. Yeah. Um, so we're, to kind of answer the ACP question, um, we're one of the programs that we have a FM spot, an EM spot, and an ACP spot each year. Um, and so if you're interested in that, please feel free to message me. Um, kind of what, what we look for for the ACP spot is we like to have folks that have had at least two years of clinical experience since they graduated. And what you do is you end up working in our urgent care um, to kind of pay for your fellowship. Um, as far as the EM and FM folks, EM, um, applicants will end up working at our level one trauma center as well as some small satellite hospitals. Um, so feeling comfortable with being at a single doc coverage hospital is pretty important in our application process. Um, and then for FM, they work at the urgent care facilities as well. And, and kind of like everybody's been saying, you don't have to have a ton of wilderness medicine experience to um, be our fellow, just have to be interested and, and you know, 
be someone that that we would feel happy teaching and traveling with and interacting with and and so that's that's kind of what we look for yeah i think um the cool thing is that we can take em fm and np slash pa right now we have a pa an fm and an em fellow and it's really cool to see them they're like self-sufficient and they interact together they they help each other out i was um I had just a, a PA with me when I was a fellow, so slightly less time together, but we still did a ton of stuff um, that crossed paths and uh, it was nice. You can carpool, you can do stuff like that. It makes things easier. Share an Airbnb when you do stuff. But um, yeah, I definitely think that being able to work at tertiary care and critical access is very unique and almost necessary to make yourself a well-rounded practitioner. I think anybody can work in a giant tertiary care center with a billion uh, resources, but you can uh, learn pretty quick that it's a different world when you're by yourself with no other doc in the whole hospital. And then you get some crashing patient with an RT who is essentially like an albuterol jockey. And you're just trying to manage this. And it's like, all right, I can handle this. This is pretty cool. Um, so it, it's good to know that like uh, when you go into a fellowship, all of the wilderness opportunities involved, but you are still a practitioner. You are still a medical provider. So it's always good to know about the, the, the place you'll be working too, even if it's as low as six shifts, I've heard some programs are more than that, like you still will be working. So um, I've, I like the fact that we work in multiple situations. Very interesting, the diversity of providers you accept at uh, Virginia Tech, thank you. And Dr. Young? Sorry, just unmuting. Um, yeah, I, I think we're all going to probably looking for similar applicants who are dedicated to wilderness medicine. You know, I think um, just to add on something that hasn't been said is um, just I want to caution people who are applying to fellows fellowships. Um, just there are there's a number of fellows that come or fellowship applications that come across my desk every interview year where it looks like someone has not really decided what they wanted to do after after residency um, and just think that wilderness medicine is fun and they're totally right it is super fun um but we're not really interested in having people who um are kind of la gra grasping for something you know to fin to do after they graduate um so really i think to give you guys some advice um is to really see if wilderness medicine is something that you love. Uh, and you can't really do that unless you participate in some of the facets of wilderness medicine. As you can imagine, the field itself is incredibly broad and there's so many different um, areas of wilderness medicines, but so like anything and everything within that whole field, like trying out a few areas and seeing what you do like and what you don't like and being able to speak to that uh, of like where you wanna go in your wilderness career. The number of applicants that I say like, oh, well, like what are your, interests like what are your research interests and people say I like high altitude and I'm like oh like what about it <laughs> like you know like you got it you got to be a little deeper right so it's incredibly competitive um uh fellowship to get there are so many applicants and there's so few spots um uh and so I think really just if, if you really do want to do wilderness medicine is you really have to kind of prove it to each of us as as fellowship directors like you have to show that you actually have dedicated yourself to the field um uh in some way and can speak it, it is at least in my opinion at least in some way and um and can show me that uh that your career will be wilderness medicine for for years to come thank you dr young i appreciate your um insight and perspective on your applicants um, Gabby, would you be able to expand upon just for like some perspective for the individuals here? Um, what are some of the prerequisites and things that allow you to get a FOM? We're trying to have an ongoing comparison for our attendees between the brick and mortar and the FOM in case people want to pursue different avenues in their journey in wilderness medicine. So the prerequisites for FOM are um, you, you have to have a, a degree that is listed. So MDDO. Uh, you can be a, a nurse, you can be a paramedic, you can be an EMT, uh, you can be a, um, um, a pharmacist. Um, so, so pretty much um, any medical professional that is practicing 
uh, has a degree and has been practicing. So uh, your degree plus the one year of professional experience in the highest degree of education where you're gonna be submitting your report is eligible. Thank you for that clarification, I appreciate it. And I'm gonna send this off to Shilpi for our final uh, predetermined question and then we'll open it up to audience. Yeah. So this will be my last question and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask whatever they want, you know, face to face. Um, but for people that go through your fellowships and have completed their education, what are some of your past fellows doing with what they've gained through your programs? Um, just wondering in positions, accomplishments, how do they use the education that they get in their future careers? So if you guys could give us some examples, that would be amazing. And we can just go in the same order if you want. Well, mine is easy. I, <laughs> I only have three. So uh, my first one, I'm very proud of her. Uh, she landed a, a medical director position uh, in uh, the Amazon in Iquitos, Peru, uh, which got um, stopped because of COVID, but she's resuming as soon as <laughs> the restrictions are out of the place. And then she also worked at uh, uh, a reservation in Arizona. And then um, my second one, Amy, she wanted to uh, stay with the contract for the um, uh, diving chamber in Carolina. Uh, and she's still working on that, uh, but she wants to stay local. And she's also doing uh, other women's related uh, consultancies. And then my third one is currently at it. So <laughs> that's what I got. <laughs> that's awesome. And those are all so diverse and so amazing. So thank you, um, Dr. Justina. So yeah, so uh, my first one is was uh, at Yale and uh, was doing was my associate fellowship director and was doing educational things as well as lots of really great things with the WMS Med Wars and and such. Uh, but then her husband, who was one of our fellows, he graduated, not kicked out. Uh, it couldn't get a job because of COVID locally, so they moved. It was rough. They had to move to Hawaii. So they took a contract there for a couple of years. They're working uh, there in a uh, on the Big Island in three different EDs there. And then our hope is to try to bring the pair of them back so they can work. Another one of my um, graduates is uh, a park a director of the uh, one of the parks out west. I can't remember which one, and is working you know clinically to actually make the money. You don't make much money being a park director or the medical director for the park service. Uh, another one is uh, this a recent grad is is a um, system fellowship director up at the Bay State Wilderness Medicine Fellowship, and then the, the final one is also a final one is is um, working just clinically. Is not doing any uh, wilderness directed stuff right now at this time. Again, COVID really made a uh, made it difficult for getting the appropriate jobs that people wanted, but they all have jobs. We're happy they have jobs and definitely COVID threw a wrench in everybody's plans, unfortunately. So everything's taken with a grain of salt. Um, Dr. Gaynor and Gardner. Yeah, so um, I was the first fellow and I ended up, you know, working, continuing to work with the fellowship. Um, like I said, for our fellowship, we have like an alarmingly high retention rate, like our, our little fledglings never fly the nest, but they stick around and they, uh, you know, a lot of our former fellows continue to teach and our faculty, um, some of the things that they still continue to do in our area, we have a couple endurance events where they'll provide medical support. Um, and then, you know, they'll continue to teach and go on these trips with us. Um, Justin's a great example who's stuck around. A, lo a lot of the folks that trained with us continue to work in critical access hospitals as well, where you're really resource limited. Um, so that's, that's kind of what everybody's been up to. Justin, do you have anything to add? I guess I'm the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm the most recent graduated fellow. And uh, like she said, I've stayed around. Um, some of our graduates have um, stayed as, and this is um, some of the ACP, ACP side, have been directors for the clinics down in Peru. So we kind of have maintained relationships with those sources from our graduates. So um, some have stayed here as faculty, some have maintained privileges at our hospital and also run uh, clinics elsewhere. So that it's, we do, we do tend to stay because Roanoke's a cool place and we become friends. So um, we like to stick around. So um, 
we are more in the local um we find ways to stay in here basically we work hard to try and stay here one other thing we had a um one of our fellows is a lifelong learner um and he's currently doing a fellowship now in hyperbarics he got really interested in dive medicine and so he's gone on to do his second fellowship now that's amazing but i definitely get big family vibes from you guys <laughs> um dr yan uh, i think similarly to um uh, to the other, to the rest of our uh, fellowship directors here, um, there's been uh, there's been a lot of fellows for us, but they've all they're kind of doing things across the board. Um, you know, from our, some of our first grads, um, there's actually I think three fellowship uh, grads who still work at the university hospital. Um, but Shilpi, you know Ryan Patterson, who was our first um, grad um, pretty well, who's doing so many things in wilderness medicine. I don't even, I can't even keep track of him. He's amazing, but um, he doesn't work at the U anymore, um, but he works at a community hospital around in the area. Um, but there's just, there's so many different things, uh, whether it's leadership positions at the WMS um, or staying out of the U or just working in the community. Um, and uh, and contributing when they can and when they have time uh, to wilderness medicine, there's kind of a whole spectrum. Awesome, yeah, big plug for Dr. Patterson. He's out like doing mountain medicine and tropical medicine and everything. So he's an amazing example of what you can do with um, training in wilderness medicine. It opens a lot of doors, um, so it's awesome. And then Gabby, would you mind kind of talking about if getting the FOM accreditation, does that open certain doors for you or certain experiences that you wouldn't be able to otherwise? So as far as FOM, uh, when you become a fellow, I, um, so, so my experience has only been short and so I'm gonna call on uh, some of the other panelists because they have been fellows, but um, uh, I would say as far as um, the individual, it's the knowledge within wilderness medicine. Uh, the extensive knowledge that you acquire during the fellowship. Um, as far as recognition, it's the recognition within the wilderness medicine uh, community. And then as far as uh, the opportunities uh, within employment or otherwise, uh, many current fellows uh, are able to come back as uh, providers, course providers for FOM approved uh, courses. So once you become a fellow, you can you can apply um, to WMS to, to host an activity that is then approved for FOM and offered to other WMS members. I don't know if uh, if if any of the other panelists uh, have anything to add to my list from their personal experience. I think it, I think as well, just to add on, Gabby is um, is that you do become part of a, a community, a larger WMS community, in a way that's um, a little bit different than just going to the conferences alone. Um, and so I think that kind of builds it. And I would say the same goes for the DIM, um, whether you're doing it through the military, through um, WMS, or through University of New Mexico. There's different different avenues for getting your DIM in this continent. Um, and uh, uh, there's just it's a way of of really building community and and finding other like minded people in wilderness medicine. Um, that I think the FOM does really well. Um, and, uh, and I think that in itself just uh, creates more opportunity in the field. That's awesome. I think the whole community of wilderness medicine as a whole feels like a family, ultimately, like a very tight knit community that I know everyone has and knows everybody. Um, so thank you, everybody, for answering those questions and sharing your insight. I'm going to hand it to Katrina so we can open up the floor. So hopefully some of our participants can have the chance to unmute and ask their questions um, kind of face-to-face. -face. So thank you again, you guys. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead if, you're, if you'd like to unmute your mic for a minute, um, just let us know and to ask, ask a question. We do have a couple questions that were asked during the um, panelist answering questions. So I'll go ahead and start with those. And then anyone else interested in asking questions, just let us know. Um, so our first question that was asked was, are there technical skills needed to ex excel in these fellowships? And we can reverse it and start with Dr. Young. <laughs> yeah, well, I was already nodding, I guess. Um, our, 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 every fellowship is going to be a little bit different, I think, in terms of their technical skills. I think probably like the actual didactics or like actually learning is probably very similar. I'm guessing um, I've only done one fellowship, but um, the uh, but ours uh, is heavy in technical skills, and we have a requirement of um, of a number of different things. We call it the canary card, um, where it's this card with um, 
uh, skills on it that you have to basically have to meet um, to some level. It doesn't have to be like incredibly proficient where you're able to like use this in a rock rescue type of situation, but you should be able to at least know of it um, in some of the very, very challenging skills that are there. So um, so we have a, like I mentioned before, Allison Sheets is our technical skills advisor and Martine Moosey, um, who is the fellowship director, who both um, work really closely with our fellows to teach um, uh, a lot of technical skills. Um, we also encourage our fellows to do the DIM, which where they can learn additional um, technical skills. But um, we have a we have a list where people have to um, meet these technical skills. It's not, I mean, if I can do it, anybody can do it. But um, but there is there's some technicality to it. I have a follow up really quick because that was my question. Um, are these skills that the fellowship facilitates their like the candidates to learn through their fellowship, or you expect them to kind of come into the fellowship by having a baseline level of skill set? We would love for people to have a baseline, but we totally understand that that's not necessarily the possible with a lot of people. And so we we have taught. Um, I think uh, Mia, one of our recent fellows, um, uh, will, wouldn't mind me using her name. Um, she graduated last year. Um, didn't come into our fellowship with much knowledge of uh, technical skills. Um, she has um, a thousand different assets in other areas, but she um, she we kind of started a little bit on a lower level with her and brought her very quickly up to speed on a lot of different technical um, uh, skills. So. Thank you. Um, does any of the other fellowships have anything to add about technical skills coming in? I, I would say for Yale and, and probably I'll speak for most of the other fellowships, our, our expectation is not that you come in already trained because that's kind of what the fellowship, a lot of the fellowship is about. So if you come in with, with fellowship, at least my fellowship, if you come in with skills, then we will modify what you do for the fellowship. Like one of mine already came in with the DIM. Uh, it was Charlie who was married to my previous wilderness fellow. So he did a lot of the stuff with her already. And so um, I modified what he did and sent him out to two different ropes courses. And he was able to use what he learned and go up on Denali and be a, uh, one, on one of the rescue teams up there because he had all the skills, but the average person coming in, I wouldn't expect to do that. So it just allows us to modify the education that you get if you come in with skills, but most don't have a specific expectation, I don't think. I think there's a fine balance between having zero experience and being so experienced why are you even doing a fellowship, like you already know this stuff. Um, but like having camped outside before, having gone rock climbing, having done some scuba diving and skiing, just being a typical outdoor person with an interest in medicine in the outdoors makes sense. And I, I've seen some applicants and had emails from people interested in, they're like, hmm, I'm going to go on my first weekend trip soon. Does, and I'm interested in medicine. Does that sound appropriate? I was like, Meh. Maybe not. But um, showing the enthusiasm and the eagerness to learn is definitely very valuable and can take you very far. Uh, and just being interested and enthusiastic can, is a strong point to your background. But yeah, having some basic, like knowing what overhand not is pretty, is pretty cool. Um, it just kind of like can take you far too. I just want to add that for sure that there are some basic technical skills that you need to know for the fellowship that I think all of us are doing because just like getting your, the AWS it, it teaches to uh, those things to you, like how to make a litter, how to make a splint, like just like the wilderness improvisation things. And I think um, little by little we'll make it so that is more, um, I don't want to say a requirement, but like a, a skill set that every uh, fellowship will teach their their their, their fellows. Um, and most of us also cater to whatever are your interests. So if you're more of a climber, we send you to like some sort of uh, technical climbing, um, uh, teaching wherever it is or whitewater rafting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the baseline wilderness improvisation skills for sure, all the fellowships are gonna teach to you. Awesome, thank you all for answering that one. It really seems like you take everyone and meet them at their needs and then bring them up to um, the accomplishments of the program. And I see Alexa from Georgetown has her hand raised. Would you like to ask your question? Hi, thank you. So just going off what Dr. Young was saying about how like not to apply for the fellowship just because it's fun, but because like having the genuine interest in the medical aspect of it. So I'm big on climbing and surfing and diving. 
And I was wondering like, if you have any recommendations on how a med student can get involved in that from like the clinical aspect to just be prepared for applying for a fellowship? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and I'll, I'll let everyone else answer as well, because there's probably 1000 different ways of doing it. However, having been in your shoes, um, I also was interested in wilderness medicine, probably late in medical school, um, and then uh, ended up choosing a residency program in emergency medicine that did train um, in wilderness medicine um, at Mass General, uh, where uh, Isabel did her fellowship. Um, and so I, I specifically chose this residency so that I would be able to get more experience. But as a medical student, to be honest, it's really, really challenging. Um, and, uh, and we, and we get that right. Like, and, uh, and we're, again, we're taking people after residency. So they've had maybe a little bit more opportunity as, um, kind of, uh, with an MD or DO after their name, um, or, uh, really any license after their name, um, that they've had more chance to. So, um, in the medical, and I was talking to Shilpi recently about this as well, it's it's just really hard as a medical student. Um, there are, I think, a few avenues through the WMS that I think are particularly useful um, and very easy to get into. And I think the FOM is one example of that. Um, but even lower level is really just going to conferences, is really just meeting people and learning uh, wilderness medicine. And WMS puts on two different conferences. Um, I am the conference planning committee chair. So just to put that out there, that I have a vested interest in uh, getting more people at these conferences. But um, but they are really great education opportunities to learn wilderness medicine and then to meet other like-minded people. Um, but uh, so I recommend going to these and then looking, for, looking forward to your, uh, seeing if your school has any different types of opportunities. Here at University of Colorado, we have a wilderness medicine interest group. Um, for those schools that don't have them, consider like starting one um, and having, creating like a little short lecture series of like even just four speakers over the course of a year, um, you know, it would be something that it would kind of start um, uh, you kind of on the path of learning kind of what wilderness medicine in the field is, who are the key players or who are some people who can help navigate this for you. And I think everybody on this panel right now would be happy to um, kind of go into a further discussion with you uh, about your interest and in how to get you involved. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's how, that's how I'd start. There's probably a lot of other ideas out there. Yeah, I'd say uh, to bounce off that real quick. First off, we are going to be reviewing the scholarships for conference reduced fees for students and residents soon. So if you're going to be attending the conference, um, on the tab is uh, how to apply, and we'll be taking an, um, applications, reviewing those, and it offers like half off for your conference reservation. It's a huge way to make it easier as a student and the resident to attend financially as a student it's tough as a resident it's a little bit better um so that's a great way and um as far as how students get involved i think that's one of the hardest things is um to try and help that is um in the education committee we're forming a like a shared gmail calendar that all the different hopefully the fellowships can help out with that and then the different sigs throughout the country can all compile opportunities available to students and residents and then have this accessible to everybody. And then we have a student leadership uh, SIG base camp group where the different SIGs can like share the information. The Facebook group is a great way to find resources. But I think unless you meet the right people and go to the right places, it can be really tough. So we're trying to remedy that with online access. So keep a lookout. Hopefully soon that should be coming your way. The other thing I'll say is someone who's a program residency program director too, and interviewing lots and lots of people for my program that, um, you know, looking at programs that have an interest in that, that have some, something going along with wilderness medicine. So all the places you see fellowships is those are places you may consider applying to um, just so that you can get more exposure. This is once you be, become a resident, just so you get more exposure to all the opportunities that are there. It's much easier for, my residents at Yale to get experience than you know elsewhere because we do lots and lots of different things and then that just makes it easier for you. So I know I interview a bunch of people who are um, have had had AWLS, um, a bunch of people who've had who are applying for their farm. And then when I and I read through the hobbies and look through and those things come up in the discussions that we have on when I'm actually interviewing. Oh, you you take where'd you take AWLS or you're applying for the farm or you you've done this or like I interviewed someone today who's a ski patroller for several years and things like that. So um, and when you're looking towards fellowships, it's really the residency is going to set you up more than what you do in medical school. But medical school sets you up to figure out that's what you want to do and look at the various places where there's fellowships.
Um, and then in day, I know I'm going to just jump in real quick. And Dave put something in, in the chat there, but the two uh, uh, wilderness medicine electives that the WMS runs, the Carillion course, uh, Virginia Tech, and the Breck Wild course are both great courses for you guys to get involved with to see that's what you truly want to do. You'll meet a lot of people with that. And that will set you up as a student to be able to go do things. And as a resident, you can get involved with them too. So uh, I would say of all the things that are available, those are probably two of the best things. If I could just say real quick, I know that I, I'm not a doctor, I'm, I'm a nurse practitioner. And when I started looking at um, ways to get involved in wilderness medicine, I was currently working in the emergency department at shock trauma. And I just started asking people who's interested in wilderness medicine, who's doing this. Turns out Dr. Sword, who works in hyperbarics and the emergency department over there had a wilderness medicine interest group. And he was the one who actually introduced me to the wilderness medical society. And for me, that's been ultimately one of the biggest inspirations in my life. So I would just put yourself out there and say to people that are around you, hey, who's interested in this? Who's doing this in this hospital? You know, when you have, you know, clinicals or even when you're in school, you know, there, there's always going to be someone who's like, hey, let's go for a hike or something like that. I just want to add, I mean, we, we do have a Wilderness Medical Society like uh, person here, but there's also chapters for the uh, SAEM and AAEM too, that you can uh, get involved that way too, with really good people. ASAP as well. <laughs> Great, thank you for all those, all that input it was super helpful. Um, I would like to direct everyone's attention to the chat. I see Gabby dropping links in for a lot of this stuff. I also dropped a link in for uh, on Gomi's website. We have also a link for resources. Um, Gomi's page has a bunch of different stuff for directed specifically towards medical students. If you're interested in getting more involved in wilderness medicine, we try to keep a ever growing resource page um, because this is something we're super passionate about and we're trying to get more people involved and educated and just um, broadening everyone's horizons. Um, Cause we all ran into that same issue of being medical students and not being able to <laughs> find too many um, opportunities. But thank you all. Um, does anyone have any more questions? Would like to raise their hand and ask questions in our audience. I do have a few more questions in the chat, but if any, I wanted to give the opportunity for individuals to ask something live if they'd like to. Not seeing anything pop up right away. So I'll ask another question and then we can see if anything else um, comes up. Another question was, is the Wilderness Medicine Fellowship match similar to other fellowships or is it a more traditional application process or can anyone expand upon that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one since we, we just did it. <clears throat> um, it is a work in progress in terms of the way that it works. Um, up until this year, this year it changed. So up, up until this year, you apply to the programs and then there was a certain time, like the, I don't know, drop dead day was like uh, November 1st and we would open up and just call people at like everyone agreed to call at noon Eastern so that the people on the West Coast would actually be awake and we wouldn't you know take all the fellows or potential fellows away from them. Um, so it was really uh, not the best way to do it. So we worked with uh, Sue Spano took on the role of basically developing a match process for us. So the way that it works now is you interview it at whatever programs you want to interview at, and then um, we will rank you and we submit our rank list to there's a Google list or there's an email that you send it to. And the WMS is the one who kind of helps us with this. And then um, we submit our rank list and you submit your rank list. And there's an algorithm that they go through to figure things out similar to the, the match program. And uh, and then the, basically you you find out, I don't, I can't remember how much after it, there's a certain time that it comes out, the, whether or not you match. And then if you didn't match and there's some programs that ha still have holes open, then that information is given to them to reach out to you to see if, um, uh, if you know, they're interested in you. So a little bit better than what it used to be. That's really cool. I'm glad that you guys are uh, making it less of a, of a helter skelter. Um, we'll just ask this last question. We got a couple of people asking about just international applicants. Um, any thoughts on that of whether it's a different process, if there's more requirements or is it totally open to international applicants? I mean, I'll jump. I'll jump on real quickly first, just because in order in order to be a fellow, you have to be 
board certified in order to work in or board, board eligible in emergency medicine in order to work in our ED to make the money to pay for your fellowship. So that's our primary requirements. As long as you can take the ABEM boards, uh, you can apply and there is no fee. You get paid to be a fellow. It's unlike medical school, you actually as a uh, you actually get paid as a fellow. So um, and I don't know if any of the other but any of the other programs do. Same as with David, um, our, you'd, you'd have to be board eligible to be able to get a job at our university hospital. We definitely have employed um, international uh, or non-citizen uh, people in our department, um, but uh, you kind of need to go through, the, you, you have to get all those visas, those work visas and things like that. So, um, so definitely doable, but, um, but that, that needs to be in place. Um, I can tell you from the, fel just to work there, but from the fellowship side, of course, we're, we're down. In fact, um, I would consider um, being an international applicant um, an asset uh, to, to deliver more perspective and um, uh, yeah, to our fellowship. Thank you. Did any of the other uh, fellowships have anything to add? Yeah, same here. Same, okay. Yep, I see Dr. Gaynor giving a thumbs up as well. Um, so it is 6.06, so I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up out of respect for everyone's time since we have met 6 o'clock and gone a little over. Um, I just want to thank our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. I know I personally have learned a ton from this experience, and I look forward to continuing to pursue wilderness medicine and maybe potentially being one of your applicants one day. Um, so I deeply want to thank all of you, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. I hope you learned as much as I did, and I look forward to seeing you all next week for our um, next lecture series. I believe next week is conservation medicine, and we're super excited to teach you all about that. As a quick plug, if you want to learn about more niches of wilderness medicine, continue to stay tuned for our lecture series. We try to highlight all of the different uh, niches and try to represent everybody. Um, I think that is all I have. Thank you for joining us. I don't know if Shilpi and Alex have anything else. Just echoing what Katrina said, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you for everyone for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening and have a good night, everyone. Bye. Everybody.